All right, hello everyone in person and online. Not really in person, but you get the point. Um, so this will be lecture number five on digital communications, subtitle and introduction. So let's see what we're gonna go over. So uh, I feel like we've done a lot of circuit stuff, but I haven't really connected it much to the communication side. And so I'll do a brief recap of that. And then we'll go into all the fun stuff about quadrature modulation, also known as IQ modulation, um, which is basically the dominant form of digital modulation used these days. And we'll talk about what's called the baseband representation. If you've taken 132A, a lot of this will be review, but I think a, a good review. Um, and then we'll talk about constellation diagrams. Yes, they, thank you for your, uh, your joke there, um, <laughs> as well as uh, intersymbol interference, which is what happens when you try to send data over a band limited channel. And to mitigate that, we'll look at what's called Nyquist stability, uh, not stability, Nyquist intersymbol interference criterion. And that's where we apply windowing. All right, so recap of what we've done so far. Let me pull out the pointer here. Uh, here we are. All right, so past four lectures, we've been focused on the right half of this diagram. I mean, you recall, this is what I showed during our first lecture where uh, basically we go from a set of bits we wanna transmit. We start in a digital domain and find our way to the analog domain. Our signal eventually gets transmitted over a wireless channel gets received in the analog domain and eventually gets converted back to the digital domain and converted back to bits at, at the end. So we'll be taking a look at what happens on the digital side um, from kind of a mathy approach. So there's gonna be some math today, but the math isn't too difficult. Um, but so basically what we've done so far is we've taken an output from a digital analog to convert, uh, digital to analog converter, uh, which is some modulated sinusoid. And we've upconverted that to a higher frequency, amplified it, and filled, done some filtering if you've done assignment four. And although we haven't been transmitting per se, we've been representing an antenna as a resistor, which is what it looks like in practice. And of course, we have some more amplification, some more filtering, and finally down conversion. And we, again, we've done that in assignment two and three and four. And eventually that lower down converted signal gets uh, converted to the digital domain through an analog to digital converter. All right, so let's get on with the program here. Quadrature modulation, also known as IQ modulation. So there's, there's a lot of math in the upcoming slides, but I'll, I'll try to work through it logically here. So we start with a signal, I call it X of T here. And X of T is just an amplitude modulated and phase modulated signal. So the amplitude modulation is this A of T here. And the phase modulation is the theta of T. And in general, you could have both amplitude and phase modulation at the same time, though you don't need to have both at the same time. So for BTSK, for example, where we're going between an amplitude of one and minus one, the amplitude is actually constant, it's one, because A is always assumed to be greater, than, or, or, um, it's always greater than or equal to zero. So to get to minus one, we really have a phase that flips between a phase of zero degrees and a phase of 180 degrees. So that's BPSK, we're just doing phase modulation. And that's why BPSK stands for binary phase shift keying. We're shifting the phase to represent different symbols. So anyway, if you uh, expand this cosine using your trigonometric identities, you clearly can get A cosine theta times cosine omega t minus a sine theta sine omega t. And that's pretty straightforward, I think. 
And so what we do is we define two terms. One is called the in-phase term, and that's I, and one's called the quadrature term, and that's Q. So I is the A cosine theta, which is just this thing here. And the Q is the A sine theta, which is this guy here. And that allows us to simplify this X of T, our, our modulated signal, to I cosine omega T minus Q sine omega T. So uh, everyone following so far? Okay. Um, so you can kind of, to, to get some intuition on why this is called in phase and why this is called quadrature, um, in phase is a signal that is multiplied by something that was in phase with our carrier signal, in this case, cosine omega t. And quadrature is multiplied, the Q of t, multiplied by sine omega t, and sine is a 90 degrees out of phase with cosine, hence the term quadrature. Okay. So what this allows us to do is instead of applying a, an amplitude modulation and a phase modulation to some cosine, instead we can amplitude modulate a cosine and a sine and then add the two together. And that effectively gets us an amplitude and phase modulated cosine. So we don't have to really worry about uh, you know, actually phase modulating or uh, a sinusoid, which is not that easy to do uh, necessarily. And this also has some other nice properties that we'll talk about shortly. All right, so how do we demodulate it? Suppose we receive a, a phase and amplitude modulated signal, which is really quadrature modulation. So what we can do is if we multiply the signal by uh, cosine omega t, we'll get the i term, the in-phase term times cosine squared omega t minus the, the quadrature term times sine times cosine. And for reference, I, I wrote the definitions of those things up here, just in case you need to look at it again. All right, so if you use your trigonometric identities again, Cosine squared is just one half plus one half cosine of double the frequency. And sine times cosine is just one half times sine of double the frequency. Okay, so what we do is then we low pass filter uh, this signal here, eff effectively getting rid of these double frequency components. So we're only left with I, of uh, I the in phase term, times one half, because the rest are higher frequencies. So I'm, I'm gonna call that yi here, that's the in-phase term. And then to get the quadrature term, we can just multiply x by sine omega t. And here I wrote minus sine because that makes the math work out nicer. Um, but you could technically do plus here and then you'd have to just add a minus sign later. But anyway, you multiply minus sine and you get minus i times cosine times sine plus Q times sine squared. And you can kind of see where this is going. Uh, cosine times sine is sine of double the frequency. And then sine squared is just one half minus one half cosine double the frequency. And then you low pass filter again, and you get one half of Q of T. So- I'm Really, David, uh, why do we need to measure for Q of T? Don't we know that it's definitionally just 90 degrees out of phase with I of T? So in general, I and Q can be different. Uh, well, I mean, they're intrinsically derived from the same signal. And um, so, so yes, by knowing um, I of T, you can find Q of T. But now so let, let's say theta is equal to 90 degrees. Then I of T is just zero, right? So if you are always looking for I of T and theta happened to be zero, then you're gonna get a zero signal at all. And that turns out to be a problem. Like say you're trying to, like say your transmitter is sending something you know, every second, a few, few symbols every second. And if a few of those symbols happen to have a theta of 90 degrees and you're only looking for the I term, 
then you're never going to find any symbols, <laughs> right? You're, it's going to be very hard to detect. But so in, in practice, um, when you send a phase modulated and amplitude modulated signal, you're getting both uh, I and Q. It's just up to you if you want to actually use both of them. Okay. So uh, I think we'll talk about later is that uh, uh, sometimes your system can have phase errors in it. And so what that means is that there might be some constant phase offset to theta. And so for BPSK, where uh, theta is equal either zero or 180 degrees, that means I is, either, is always either um, uh, one or minus one, or I should say A or minus A, right? Um, the problem is that sometimes there might be a phase offset. And if the offset happens to be 90 degrees, then I is going to be zero. So you really have to look at both of them to uh, accurately receive data. Okay. So, so anyway, yeah, we, we get the in phase term, we get the quadrature term here. And then to recover the amplitude modulation and the phase modulation, uh, we can just um, take the kind of the magnitude of the in phase and the quadrature terms. So here I'm just doing two times y i, which gets me i. So I do i squared plus two times y q, which is just q. So i squared plus q squared, which is a squared cosine squared theta plus a squared sine squared theta. And that's just A. And then similarly for the phase modulation, we can just take the inverse tangent of yq over yi, which is really q over i. And uh, q, is sine, uh, q is a sine theta, i is cosine, a cosine theta. And so the inverse tangent of that is just theta. Right. So far, so good. I write here very important stuff because if you don't understand this, uh, what follows might be harder to understand as, as well. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm keeping this up here for reference, just in case you need it. So now what we can do, and this is where things get funky, is we can start introducing complex exponentials. So this is kind of similar to the, the phaser representation of uh, circuits. So like, you know, you represent the capacitor as a one over J omega C impedance and a conductor as J omega L. Um, and then your voltage source might be a complex exponential like V naught times uh, E to the J omega, uh, J omega T. So what we do here, is we can write this uh, x term here as this. So if you do e to the j omega t plus theta and take the real part of that, um, you're just going to get the uh, phase modulated cosine. And then we multiply that by a of t to get the amplitude modulation. Though in general, a of, a of t is a real number. so you could technically take it out of the, the real uh, parentheses. But anyway, we can separate out this complex exponential into two complex exponentials. Um, and, and for the mathematicians out there, j is, j is i, the imaginary number. Um, but anyway, we, so now that we could uh, obtain a of t times <laughs> times e to the j theta of t. And then of course we have this e to the j omega not t. And so I'm gonna rewrite this stuff here as what I'm calling xbb. bb stands for baseband. And oh, I have this. And so what's inside of this, uh, these parentheses here is called the analytic signal. That's just the, the terminology for it. And so at XBB here is defined as A of T times cosine theta of T plus J 
a of t sine theta of t. Because if you expand out um, this complex exponential here, that's indeed what you get. And so if you remember, a of t times cosine theta of t is equal to the in-phase term, and a of t sine theta of t is equal to the quadrature term. And so again, we call this, this whole thing here, the baseband representation of uh, this amplitude and phase modulation. And so what baseband really means is that we're taking the modulation around the carrier signal and treating it separate from the carrier frequency. So we don't really care what frequency that signal is at. All we care about is well, how is its phase being modulated and how is its amplitude being modulated. And this convenient representation allows us to move all of that modulation down to zero frequency. So all of the frequency components are centered around zero hertz instead of the carrier frequency. And that makes analysis a lot easier. Um, and then the uh, complex numbers. So remember that we're sending real signals. There's no complexness about or imaginariness about the signals we're sending in space. Um, so the complex nature of baseband is really just a mathematical artifact. It has no real um, you know, physical meaning. But what's nice is that uh, we can like take the phase of XBB, the baseband, and the phase of a complex number is just the arctangent of the imaginary part of the real part, which is just the arctangent of Q over I, which if you remember is theta of T. So taking the phase of XBB gives you the phase modulation and likewise taking the magnitude gives you the amplitude modulation. So that's a nice little property. And so what we do is that we model the entire communication system at baseband, which is to say we take um, all the things that happen at the carrier frequency, uh, you know, around the carrier frequency, we move it all down to zero frequency, call it baseband, and do the analysis there. And we'll, we'll kind of see an example of how that works. Okay. Any questions? Sorry, could you uh, this quickly go over again what what uh, what baseband representation meant like it didn't exactly follow yeah let, let me see if i have anything no okay so yeah let me let me draw it down here so if i have amplitude and phase modulation on a carrier frequency so say my say this is frequency and I have my carrier frequency here, I'll call it uh, F naught. And in general, I have some amplitude modulation and phase modulation on this carrier frequency. So that means I'll have some bandwidth around the carrier frequency that'll contain that modulation information. Because remember, if you multiply something by a cosine, you're really, shifting all of that up to the cosine frequency. So, you know, I'll have some, some sort of bandwidth and all of that information will be contained in that bandwidth. So what I'm doing with the baseband representation is I'm saying, uh, regardless of what the carrier frequency actually is, um, the modulation, uh, spectrum doesn't really change. It's just shifted up and down in frequency. So what I can do is I can basically move all of that information. Yeah. I can move all of that information down to zero Hertz and analyze it there. So this, this is still F naught, but I, I've moved all of that information down to zero Hertz. And in doing so, I, I basically come up with this representation right here. So notice that this X baseband uh, has no dependence on the carrier frequency anymore. 
it's basically centered around um, zero hertz. And yes, there's a cosine and a sine here. However, those aren't like some omega naught t cosines and sines. Those are theta of t. And theta might, is not switching at the same rate as uh, omega naught t. You know, in general, your um, the rate of your modulation, like how many symbols you're sending per second is way slower than the carrier frequency. So does, does that make sense? Yep, yep. All right. Okay, so uh, I've switched up the reference here. So now it's showing this X baseband uh, representation. And so because X baseband is now a complex number, we can plot it on a complex plane, which is a very convenient representation of modulations. So uh, this, if you recall this diagram here, I showed it during our first lecture of what a BPSK waveform looks like. So you have your binary data stream. So this, you know, here's your one, here's your zero. I guess there's two zeros there. Here's a one, and another zero, and a one, and a one, and so on. Uh, interestingly, this zero is a different length than this one, but we'll go with it. <laughs> and then, so that that's our, you can kind of think of this as the uh, the uh, baseband waveform of the BPSK modulation. So if I kind of cut the axis here and say this value here is a minus one, and this right here is a one, then I've, I've this is the baseband waveform for BPSK. Um, and then if I modulate that onto a carrier frequency, then I get what's below here, where every, um, every symbol, I change the phase of the carrier frequency. So, you know, you see right here, there's a phase change. I've multiplied by minus one. And so now the phase of the carrier frequency flips and that denotes a different symbol. Okay, so what we can do is plot all this on the complex plane. So that's what that's what's shown here on the right. And so this point here, which represents a binary one, is basically um, zero phase, right, and amplitude one. So like this is the the unit circle, let's say. And if I have a zero, a, a, a binary zero, that corresponds to a phase of 180 degrees with an amplitude of one, which ends up on this point here. And in general, I, I don't have to choose zero and 180 degrees. I could choose, say, over here in 90 degrees and minus 90 degrees. It's really the same thing, just you just, you just kind of rotate the entire graph by 90 degrees. And I mean, either way is perfectly fine. It's just, you know, convention or, or personal preference. Um, so, right. And here's what that would look like in, you know, a complex number representation. 180 degrees is just e to the j times pi. Okay. And uh, these are all called constellation diagrams. And the reason that is, is uh, if I go to the next slide, I guess it'll be more apparent. Um, I've, I've been showing BPSK, but in general, you can have higher order modulations. And by higher order, I mean there's a, a larger number of possibilities for each symbol. So for BPSK, I have zero and 180 degrees. Uh, there's something called four QAM, which stands for quadrature amplitude modulation. And here I have four different possibilities. I have 45 degrees, I have um, 135 degrees, I got minus 135 degrees and minus 45 degrees. And because I have four different symbol possibilities, I, I can now assign more bits per symbol. So if you recall during the first lecture, I said the number of bits assigned to each symbol, which I'm calling N here, 
is equal to the log base two of big M. Big M is the number of symbols or the modulation order. So here for four quam, there's M, big M is equal to four. So log base two of four is two, which means I can assign two bits per symbol. So here I'm assigning a zero, zero, a one, zero, one, one, and zero, one. And the, the mapping of bits to symbols is pretty arbitrary. I mean, the, some choices are usually better than others, but I mean, like BPSK, you got two choices and they're, they're equivalent. It doesn't matter which way you go. Okay, and then there's higher order modulations. Here is 16 quam. And you can see, you can count them. There's 16 points there, 16 different symbols to choose from. And the interesting thing here is that there's a, there's a different phases. So like, you know, here you have 45 degrees, here you have 135 degrees, but there's also different amplitudes. So this guy here is uh, a phase of 45 degrees, but it has an amplitude of three instead of an amplitude of, sorry, not three. This would be uh, uh, square root of 18. Right, yeah, square root of 18, and this guy would have an amplitude of one. So does, does that make sense to everyone? Okay. And I, <laughs> I wrote this note down here. Hopefully that's mildly encouraging. So all, all of this stuff seems relatively simple. And I, I hope at least. And it turns out that all of this is actually used in real communication systems. So right here, the Wi-Fi's, 4G LTE's, 5G new radio, they all use quadrature amplitude modulation as well as BPSK. Um, so this is not like, you know, stuff from a hundred years ago that nobody uses anymore. People actually use it. So our, our, um, our signal value, so to speak, like A of T and theta of T, um, while they are analog, we kind of introduce our own discretization to them and tie certain sets of values to binary meaning. Correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's kind of what the symbol to bit mapping does, right? Um, yeah, okay. And then, of course, the hard part is how do you detect which symbol is which on like a microcontroller, for example? And that'll be the topic of a later lecture, not this one, though. <laughs> but don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. All right, so what we've done is all fine and dandy. However, of course, nothing is ever that simple. Uh, there's things called radio impairments or RF impairments. There's different words for it. And what that means is uh, as a signal travels along the channel between your transmitter and receiver, it'll encounter a variety of non-idealities. And so that might be noise, for example, a thermal noise. So like random variations in your sing uh, in like voltages or currents. And um, there can also be phase errors uh, that I mentioned earlier, where instead of having a nice theta of t, you might have a theta of t plus theta naught, so like a constant phase offset, or you might even have a theta of t times uh, a theta I don't know, sub v of t. That depends on how fast your receiver is moving with respect to your transmitter. And that, that's called the you know, that's the Doppler effect essentially, where as your, uh, you know, your transmitter and receiver are moving with respect to each other, uh, the, the effective frequency of the carrier might change as a function of the velocity, but we won't really get into that here. Um, there's kind of two things we're mainly concerned about. One is noise and one is phase offset or constant phase offset. And so here I show uh, a constellation diagram for a particular uh, modulation. Can anybody name the modulation? It was in the last slide. 
four QAM quadrature amplitude modulation. That's right. Whatever. Yeah, uh, often it's pronounced qualm or quam. Uh, but yeah, four qualm. Not can, quam. It's not it's quam. quam. Definitely yeah. quam. <laughs> yeah. And you, you can tell because there's four discrete, you know, clouds of points here. And they're kind of arranged in a square. That That's kind of the signature of quadrature amplitude modulation. But anyway, uh, on the left guy here, so this one here, you notice that the entire constellation is rotated by uh, roughly like 45 degrees or so around there. And that, that's essentially a constant phase error. What that means is we take our, our baseband representation, XBB, and we've multiplied it by some constant phase. Let's call it theta naught. And here, theta naught is equal to 45 degrees. And in the complex plane, that has the effect of rotating, rotating everything by uh, 45 degrees. OK, and then in practice, we'd have to correct for that. Because if, if these, you know, these clouds of points here aren't where we expect them to be, then we'll have kind of no hope of actually detecting which symbol is which. So to do that, you can probably guess, we just multiply this by e to the minus j theta naught. <laughs> then that rotates everything back to where it should be. Because you know, this times this is just one. Of course, the trick is determining what theta naught is. And there's techniques of doing that, which uh, you'll look at in, your, in the assignment for this lecture. Okay, um, the other thing is noise. So ideally each of these discrete four points should look like a single dot um, at, at those positions. But instead you'll have random fluctuations in amplitude and that'll cause uh, your perfect points to kind of spread out in the constellation diagram. And so the more spread out they are, the higher noise level you have with respect to your signal, your signal to noise ratio. And so of course you wanna maximize your SNR. Now the problem is if these things get too spread out, um, the, you, you might recognize a certain symbol as something that it's not. It's so like if one of these points here kind of wandered off down here, then it might look more like one of these guys, and that'll be an error, uh, a bit error, or a similar error rather. I have a question. This is this looks strangely similar to clustering. Like, uh, is... okay, so, <laughs> so I, I guess clustering would be a way of determining which symbol is which, um, without any knowledge of what the transmitter is sending. So, like. If the transmitter could send four qualm, 16 qualm, or BPSK, and you have no a priori knowledge of which one it's actually sending, you could use a clustering algorithm to uh, cluster received symbols into different groups and determining which, and if you get like 16 clusters, for example, you can kind of guess that's uh, 16 qualm, right? Um, gotcha. but it, yeah, so in uh, there's a you can, you can kind of analytically determine what is the best thresholds between different symbols. Um, that, that, and the best threshold that'll give you the lowest error. And it turns out for four qualm, it's what I just drew, uh, drew here. Um, anything that's to the left of the vertical axis and above. The horizontal axis you associate with this group, and similarly for the other guys. So for BPSK, if I kind of drew the constellation diagram over here, where this is the in phase axis and this is the quadrature axis, so like the, the real and imaginary axis, axes, um, 
I'll have a cloud of points around here, and I'll have a cloud of points around here. And, oops, didn't mean to draw that one. And so, I mean, can somebody guess what our threshold would be in determining which symbols which? A vertical line along the imaginary axis. Right. Hey, I guess it's it's pretty obvious that if if something is to the right of this axis, then we choose this group, which is phase of zero. And if something's to the left, then we choose a phase of 180. And of course, this only makes sense if you've already corrected for the phase error. Otherwise, you get like points around here and uh, I don't know, points around here. And that's that will get you the right answer all the time. So you got to correct for the phase first. Um, and then going back to Cody's question about clustering, uh, here we know exactly what our transmitter is going to be sending because we, we're, we're the ones creating the transmitter, right? <laughs> so we're, we're always going to be sending BPSK, for example. And thus, we can always know uh, what the, the optimal uh, threshold is. Gotcha. So clustering is useless here because we already know everything. Right, exactly. Um, oh, my cursor disappeared. It's back. OK, good. Uh, yeah, so I think I said everything on this slide here. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so we talked about noise and phase offset, and there's even worse things that can happen, of course. <laughs> Nothing's ever perfect. So um, when you're sending things along a wire, for example, like let's say ethernet cable or USB cable, uh, the entire wire is yours to use. Like you, you, there's no way you're going to interfere with other people's transmissions because your data is bound to that wire. And if the wire is a higher quality one, it'll basically shield any, any outside radiation from affecting uh, your, uh, your information. So what that means is that you can transmit data starting from DC all the way up to the bandwidth of that cable. So like the, if you looked at the frequency response of just like a wire or a USB cable, for example, you might see something that looks like this. It'll be constant for a while and eventually it'll start dropping off. And this is of course uh, like voltage or something. Like if you insert a, a voltage from one end and you look at the other end, eventually it'll start dropping off in frequency because of like parasitic capacitance of the wire and inductance and other losses. So uh, what that means is that there's a maximum uh, data rate you can transmit at before your signal starts getting affected by this attenuation. And of course, remember that your data rate is proportional to the, the bandwidth of your signal. And we'll kind of talk about that shortly. So you might send like, a, I don't know, some square wave, or I shouldn't say square wave, let me, let me change that a little. You might send, data in the form of rectangular pulses. So, I don't know, here's a zero, here's a one, here's another one, here's a zero, here's a one, another zero, zero and one. And the question is, what is the bandwidth of this uh, waveform here? And it turns out, uh, if you if you assume that these edges here are perfectly straight, like you have infinitesimally small rise times for your square your your uh, your square wave there, uh, 
then the bandwidth or the, the frequency spectrum kind of looks like this plot down here. This is the magnitude squared of it, by the way, not, not uh, uh, the actual thing. So each uh, data uh, bit essentially looks like a, a rectangular pulse. And if you recall, the Fourier transform of a rectangular pulse is just a sync function. And can somebody say what the bandwidth of a sync function is? Get wrecked. It's a wrecked function. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not sure what that meant, but OK. <laughs> um, well, basically, the sync function continues on infinitely in frequency. And so the problem with that is that our wire doesn't have an infinite frequency response. At some point, the amplitude starts dropping off. So what happens as you go higher and higher in your uh, data rate is that um, you're basically shrinking this rectangular function smaller and smaller. And in the Fourier domain, that'll widen this sync function. Because look, if you look here, uh, this point here is one over T. So as we shrink T, which is to say we increase the data rate, we're going to increase one over T and that'll widen the sync function. So we're essentially uh, moving uh, the energy that's uh, the energy of the signal or the power of the signal wider and wider in frequency. And so at some point, you know, your information might start encroaching upon this attenuation area and start getting chopped off essentially. And what happens then? Well, some badness happens, bad stuff. Uh, so in the time domain, what that kind of looks like is instead of having perfectly sharp edges, uh, you'll have some, it'll basically smear out the entire signal. So here at this, this thing here is showing me transmitting a one, a zero, zero, zero. And the one will get smeared out to look like this. And if we're measuring what the value of that, that signal is at these points here, what'll end up happening is that uh, some of your one will start overlapping into the next symbol. So you'll get what's called inter-symbol interference, which is to say, you know, adjacent symbols will start affecting each other. And this problem can get bad enough where your zeros will start looking like ones and your ones might start looking like zeros. So in the second row here, I have a one, a zero, one, one. And this is just plotting what that uh, looks like in the time domain after going through this, this wire with a limited frequency response. So your one will get smeared out and so will the other two ones. And if you add the results together, you get this, this kind of mess where here, like we were supposed to have a zero right here, but if this point here is high enough, then we might recognize it as a one. And that's bad news because uh, uh, you'll start getting a lot of uh, uh, error in your communication system. So does everybody understand why this problem exists? I'll take that as a yes. Okay. Um, now in a uh, wireless communication system, there's an even bigger problem. And that is we don't have the entire wire to ourselves. So in actuality, we have to transmit within a limited uh, frequency band, in our case, like 20 or 40 kilohertz. So even if we wanted to transmit at a incredibly high uh, uh, data rate and our communication system had a frequency response that allowed that to happen, we would still be limited by the FCC in uh, what uh, frequencies we're allowed to transmit in. So if we were to transmit using these rectangular pulses, we would have a sync function looking uh, frequency spectrum. And because you had these like little side lobes here, 
those will start interfering with other people's communications and that's not allowed. So we've got to mitigate that somehow. The, the, so the, these things are kind of similar problems um, where you have a band limited channel and that band limited channel will kind of limit how sharp you can transition your, uh, your signals. Okay, so there's something called the Nyquist intersymbol interference, or no intersymbol interference, I should say, no uh, criterion. And so what this criterion says is that there's a method that we could use to construct our signals such that we get a zero intersymbol interference, and we can also get a band limited uh, symbol that we don't inter such that we don't interfere with other people's uh, channels. And so the exact statement of this criterion is right here, where the impulse, or I should say the uh, uh, the shape of your symbols in baseband, now note that this is baseband, not, not at the carrier frequency. Uh, the symbols cannot overlap at the sampling points. So what that means is, uh, say, say I uh, uh, you know, transmit a pulse that kind of looks like this, and have another pulse that looks like this, and another one that looks like this. So these are different pulses in time. And here I'll have T, oops, not there. Here I'll have zero, and then here I'll have T right here. And here I'll have minus T. So these are three different symbols that are I'm sending consecutively one after the other. And they slightly overlap. Um, whether it be due to, you know, well, that's just, go, go with it for now. Um, they slightly overlap. And I'm stipulating that when they overlap, well, first I'm going to sample uh, these symbols right at uh, multiples of t, right? And uh, and it's just in order to determine which symbol, which particular symbol it is. In this case, these three are identical, but you know, you could have a flipped phase or something. Um, so, but I'm going to sample them at regular intervals, which is to say, I'm going to sample them at the uh, symbol rate, the rate at which I'm sending symbols. And when I sample one of these symbols, what I want to happen is that. Uh, all the other symbols essentially go to zero at that particular point. So that's kind of what this is showing here, where uh, if I call this guy symbol one, this guy's symbol two, sorry, I should have called this guy one, two, and this guy's three. If I sample here at time t, symbol one and two both go to zero at time t. And if I can ensure that that's the case, even if these things get smeared out, um, I can ensure that there's zero intersymbol interference. And that, that's what Nyquist's no intersymbol interference criterion is. So uh, I have a nice picture right here showing that in a more clear diagram. So in here I'm, I'm sending uh, uh, sync pulses instead of square waves or, or square pulses. Um, but what this is showing is that if I, if I call this guy one, two, three, four, and five, and I sample here, here, and here, as well as right here and right here, notice that uh, like for, for symbol four, at this point here, all the other symbols go to zero which is uh, what we desire for zero intersymbol interference. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, it, it makes sense. And I can maybe kind of see how this works with uh, 
amplitude modulation, but how do you like make them line up this well with the phase modulated? Uh, if you're if you're phase modulating as well to capture your zeros and ones. Right. So uh, these this plot here is not actually showing the symbols itself. Maybe I should clarify that. It's showing the, uh, uh, I guess, the impulse response of the transmitter. So if my symbols really do look like, uh, like square, uh, some square wave looking thing, for example, what I'll do is I'll, I'll take one of these sync functions and I'll use that as an impulse response uh, for my transmitter. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, convolve this guy with the impulse response. And if my impulse response looks like this, or like one, one of these sync functions, that that is the criterion for no inter symbol interference. So it's not the symbol itself per se, but it's the impulse response of our transmitter. So but basically what we're doing is that we're passing the symbols through a filter first before we transmit it, or before we modulate it onto the carrier frequency, I should say. Does that make sense? I hope so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, th there's, there's a lot of math behind this and I, I don't think it's right to cover all of that here. So if you're, if you're interested in it, I can, I can talk to you afterwards. But also if you uh, take 132A, you'll talk all about this. So the other thing I'll mention about this is that in the frequency domain, there is an equivalent criterion which is this guy. And what that's saying is that if we take the impulse response and take the Fourier transform, that'll get us this big H of T, or big H of F, I should say. And if we shift uh, H of F by uh, multiples of, of the, the symbol rate, so one over TS, the symbol period, and you add all of those up, you should get a constant, in this case, TS. And so that's what this plot down here is showing. If we take the Fourier transform of our H of T and uh, note that this is, uh, these are two different H's. Um, so this guy here would be H of F. And then this guy here would be H F minus one over TS. Uh, here it says one over T, but same thing. Okay, so, and, and if you add these together, you'll get just a, a flat line for all frequency. That's the goal at least. And so you notice the, these kind of look uh, sync, like sync function like, the problem with using sync functions, while they do meet this criterion, the problem with the sync function is A, it's a non-causal signal, meaning um, it extends into negative frequencies as well as positive frequencies. So that's a problem. Uh, there, there's way to, ways to solve that, but uh, it's not a nice problem. The other problem is that it also extends infinitely in time. And so what that means is uh, uh, if, if there's any like jitter or uh, errors in your, in your uh, TS, like your sampling period, where instead of like sampling right at these points here, you start shifting over like right here instead or right here, then you could run into large errors because um, the impulse response of that sync function lasts for a long time. So it'll start affecting uh, symbols down the line. So there's better alternatives to the sync function filter. And one of the most common is called the raised cosine window. And 
just for your reference, this is what the frequency response of that looks like. And you'll need this for your assignment. But basically, it's defined in a piecewise fashion. Um, if you look at the frequency response down here, basically what it's saying is that anything that is larger than any frequency that's larger than one plus beta over two t, where beta is some constant of your choice, we call that zero. Okay, so that that gives us a finite bandwidth, where you know anything beyond this frequency has to be zero. So that's good. Um, anything that's uh, below a certain frequency, we just call a constant, TS in this case. And then anything within a certain range of frequencies, we use the raise cosine part. So it's just a cosine function plus one, which is to say we're, we're raising the cosine up by one. That's, that's where the name comes from. And so what that looks like in actuality is what this look in this bottom plot here. So for different values of beta, you get either something that looks like a square rectangular pulse, which is you know the extreme that we didn't really want. That's the sync function filter. And at the other extreme, you get this curve right here, this uh, bluish looking one, which has a pretty slow roll off, but at a uh, uh, plus or minus one over t, it goes to zero. And then in the time domain, the impulse response looks like this. So for different val values of beta, we either get something that looks like a sync function, which is this blue guy here, or something that uh, has a lot less ripple, and uh, uh, which is this guy right here. And less ripple is nice. However, the trade-off you have to make is that you're using more bandwidth in the frequency domain. So that's uh, there's trade-offs to make. So this beta guy is what's called the roll-off factor of the raised cosine window. And it's, you can kind of visualize that where the higher beta is, the slower this uh, rolls off in the frequency domain. And when beta goes smaller, then this roll-off gets sharper and sharper until eventually when beta equals zero, you get this rectangular function. Um, and then just as a, you know, a figure to determine how much bandwidth you're actually using, if you have this rectangular function, your bandwidth, which I'm defining as this guy right here, this is your bandwidth, is equal to one over two T or to TS, I should say, the TS is sampling period, the symbol period, I mean. And uh, uh, when you start uh, uh, increasing beta, you, ha you have some additional bandwidth. And so at the extreme, you had this guy here, this delta T, or the delta F, I mean, when beta is equal to one, so you have an additional one over two TS bandwidth. And so that's what this is showing here. Okay, so that, that good with everyone? So I, ideally we want a bandwidth that's as low as possible because that means we get less leak off when we're uh, less uh, overlap when we're trying to send more frequent signals well yes and no so if your if your system was perfect except for the fact that you had a finite uh, channel bandwidth which is uh, you know this thing right here um, if your system was perfect except for that, then yes, um, take uh, uh, decreasing your bandwidth would uh, help with that up to the point where we're, you're within that constant region of the channel where uh, you know attenuation and phase isn't actually changing much over frequency. So like, uh, here, let me draw it again. If your channel kind of looks like this, 
and you restrict your your uh, in your bandwidth, or you, you restrict your your uh, communications to be within this band right here. Because the channel is basically flat in this region, there is no uh, intersymbol modulation, and that's that's nice and happy. So it would make sense to use as much bandwidth as you can because it's available to you. Now, the, of course, if you're operating inside the wireless channel where you have other people that are transmitting stuff, then you might want to choose a smaller bandwidth, but that's, that's a case by case basis. But the other problem is that there's non, other non-idealities in your system. Uh, like for example, when you use a sync function, like I said, you have these large ripples uh, that extend infinitely in time. And so if you have some timing errors in your sampling uh, system, where instead of sampling directly at this peak right here, you're off by a tiny bit, these ripples can start adding up and that'll give you uh, error or intersymbol interference essentially. So it, it's, it's kind of a trade-off, right? And by uh, making beta larger, you're using more bandwidth, but you're also reducing that ripple. And uh, so you have to choose one or the other. If you have a fixed bandwidth um, and you want to maximize how many symbols you're sending per second, um, then you have to choose a particular beta that'll give you that depending on how your system and its non-ideologies non work out. So it's kind of a empirical sort of thing, I'd say. Okay, I, I didn't write the, uh, the impulse response for the raise cosine filter, but you could find that on Wikipedia or something. It's, it's pretty easy to find. Okay, so how do we actually implement a raised cosine filter in an actual system? So I, I said earlier that we want to uh, filter these symbols before we transmit them, but it turns out we also want to filter them after we receive them. And the reason that is, is that if our transmitter and receiver filter are identical, uh, that gets us what's called the matched filter case. And that actually maximizes the amount of SNR in your system, which is a, a good thing. And there's a way to prove this. And uh, if you take 132A, you will prove it. Uh, so if you're interested in that, let me know. Um, but basically what that means is that we want the overall uh, transfer function or frequency response of our system to be a, a raised cosine filter. However, we want the same filter on the transmitter and receiver. So what we do is just take the square root of the, the, the frequency response of the raised cosine, which is called the root raised cosine filter. And we stick half of it on the transmitter side and half of it on the receiver side. So if our transmitter filter is GT, GT, it's just going to be the root raised cosine uh, filter. And same for the receiver filter, I'm calling GR. Oops. Yeah. So they're, they're going to, the filters are going to be the same. And together, they make up the raised cosine filter. Okay. And then if you were to write out the entire frequency response of the system, what that would look like is you'd have G of T times the channel. The channel is what you don't really have control over. It's what happens to your signal as it's traveling through the air and then gets affected by your analog circuits and so on. And then you have the receiver filter. Um, and then, this would be together is the frequency response of your system. 
and I'm ignoring the noise and everything here in this diagram. And this guy times this guy gives you the, the raised cosine filter. Right? Any questions? Okay. So a lot of words here. Um, here I just listed out step by step what you actually do in a digital communication system. So we'll go through each step. And if anybody has any questions, stop me, because now's the time. All right, so hope these things are fairly self-explanatory. But first, we, we, we have some set of bits that we need to map to symbols. And so that's what we do first. And our mapping is determined by which modulation we use. And we, and we first map to the baseband representation of symbols. So for BPSK, that's one and minus one, or equivalently one and one with 180 degrees phase shift. Okay, next we can represent these symbols as time shifted delta functions. So what, what I mean by that is say you have a series of symbols, like uh, say I have one, minus one, it's a terrible minus one, um, let's say if I have something like this, another minus one and say another one and so on. And I'm sending these one after the other. So what I can represent this in kind of a, a baseband notation, I have one delta function at time zero. I have another delta function at time ts, where ts is my symbol period. This will have a value of minus one and so on. This will be two ts, this will be minus one. Really, I should show this flipped around the axis, but you get the point, I hope. <laughs> and then three ts, I have another minus one, and then so on. Sorry, this is plus one. Um, okay, so that's that's representing the symbols as time shifted delta functions. Okay, so next step, we filter these delta functions with the root raised cosine filter to obtain the baseband representation of uh, kind of the, the the actual waveform we want to modulate onto the carrier signal. And so remember that our our uh, uh, root raised cosine frequency response kind of looks like this, right? So this is in frequency. And we're going to uh, multiply this with the frequency response of this, or equivalently convolve the impulse response of this with this, you know, just filter it essentially. And that'll produce. Um, those sync looking things just time shifted, right? Because that's what a delta function does. I'm drawing this terribly, but uh, I hope you get the picture. And the big point here is that each of these time shifted sync looking functions goes to zero um, at all the other deltas. I didn't draw that very well, but Hopefully you get the point there. Okay, next we modulate baseband representation onto carrier frequency. Um, so this is just the, the step where we take our X baseband, oops. I should mention that this is basically X baseband after the, the filtering process. So we take our X baseband, we multiply it to uh, our carrier frequency. So that's e to the J omega naught T. And then we take the real part. And this is what we transmit 
that's that's supposed to be an antenna, but that's that's what we end up transmitting to uh, the receiver. So that's this step here. We transmit this modulated carrier signal. The signal travels through the wireless channel, and hopefully our receiver receives this uh, carrier signal, this modulated carrier signal, and then we demodulate it. So remember, demodulating is we take this, we receive this, this thing, and we extract X base band, which is equal to I plus J Q, right? The in phase plus the quadrature. Um, so we extract that by multiplying this by, with, by a cosine and then by a sine, low pass filtering, and that's how we get I and Q, if you recall. Okay, and then I, uh, uh, I think I did this out of order here. Whoops, I should fix that. This step comes first. So first we apply the, uh, uh, actually, you know, it really depends, but I'll, I'll keep it in this order. So once we have X baseband, then we'll apply another root raised cosine filter, and that gets us the overall raised cosine filter, which is what we want to avoid intersymbol interference. And then finally, we can sample our symbols uh, at these particular points here. It's like here, here, and here. And we can detect which symbol is which. And once we know which symbol is which, we can map those symbols to bits. And once we have bits, we're done, right? Then you can do whatever you want with your bits. That's up to uh, whatever uh, system this is a part of. Okay, so any questions on that? Because if uh, this is basically what your assignment will be, implementing this in MATLAB. So uh, if you don't understand it, I suggest you ask now. Okay, okay wait. So um, just, just to make sure I'm following this right. Um, actually, could you explain the second one on there one more time? Represent the symbols as time shifted delta functions. Yeah, so that, that's something I haven't really talked about much. Um, basically, uh, we have this uh, raised cosine window that we want to apply to our, our symbols. And what that means is that we're going to convolve uh, this impulse response with our symbols. But what exactly is our symbol representation at this point? Uh, I mean, at this point, it's just complex numbers. Like you have a, a one or a minus one or one with 45 degrees phase shift for quam. Um, but what does it mean to convolve an impulse response with that? And so what that means here is that we're representing each of those uh, symbol, uh, each of those symbols as a delta function and the delta function's value is uh, that, that symbol. Like it'll be one, it'll be minus one, it'll be minus one, or sorry, one with a 45 degrees phase shift um, or whatever. And by convolving the root raised cosine impulse response with those delta functions, you're basically shifting the impulse response to its respective location in time. And you're multiplying it by that complex number that represents the symbol. Right, and, and so the, the relation with a delta function at a specific frequency to a certain symbol, a certain baseband representation of a symbol is an artificial one that we're ascribing to it. Yeah, so yeah, none of these are physical signals in our system, it's all mathematical. Okay, and then, then when we receive um, a certain set of 
uh, root um, raised cosines and multiplied with another root raised cosine, then by detecting which raised cosines are present at like which frequencies, we can tell which deltas were present in our original thing. And from that, we know what symbols were sent. Well, okay, so first it's, these guys are not frequencies, they're, they're times, right? Um, but after we do the second convolution with the second root raised cosine filter, um, we're basically going to get, uh, uh, you know what? Let me show you the example. <laughs> and I think this has become more clear, okay? So let me show you the example of what this actually looks like. Um, if I can, oops, let me get out of here. Okay, so here, okay. So first I'm just showing you the impulse response of a root raised cosine. It's just the square root of the raised cosine. So it looks pretty similar, right? Okay. so. This is where things get interesting. So here I'm plotting a random set of BPSK um, uh, symbols. So these, these blue dots here represent individual BPSK symbols, either a one or a minus one. Uh, so yeah, those are just randomly generated and they're essentially Kronecker deltas. So instead of like an actual delta where uh, at that at the delta point, it goes to infinity. Uh, here, it's just one, right? And then I'm multiplying it by a one or a minus one. So it's it's the discrete form of the delta function. Okay, and then after that, I convolve it with the root raised cosine. That's this orange waveform here, the smaller one. And so it doesn't really look like anything pretty great with the orange guy. Um, but when I convolve it again with the root raised cosine in order to get the raised cosine filter, that's what this yellow waveform is showing. And you notice at those particular sample points where the delta functions occur, the root raised cosine, uh, or sorry, the raised cosine filtered signal um, uh, intersects those points exactly at those at those time points. And at any other time points, um, there's really no guarantee of what the value is, um, but we don't really care because we're not sampling at those points. So does that make more sense? Yeah, yeah, so, so, Okay, so I was, I was thinking about it wrong. If, if I follow right, the root raised cosine function is more like our intelligent choice of function for converting, for converting digital bits into an analog signal that we can actually put on our carrier wave. Right, so yeah, the, the non-intelligent way of doing it would just be to use a rectangular function as your impulse response. But here we're using something that's going to give us a smaller bandwidth and uh, less intersymbol interference. Got it. OK. So implementing this is part of your assignment. All right. OK, anyone else? Questions, questions? Okay, the next is just the assignment, right? So uh, not many people have finished the assignment four. So uh, I'm making this due in a couple of weeks, but that may or may not be extended. And I'll post it either tomorrow or Saturday. Um, I, I, I say tomorrow or Saturday, but that usually ends up being Sunday, so, uh, or Saturday midnight but I'll, I'll try to get it earlier rather than later. Um, so your job or your, your mission, should you choose to accept it for this assignment, is to implement the following in BPSK. 
So first you're gonna be generating random bits like I did and mapping those bits to BPSK symbols and modulating those onto a carrier, sending the symbols, receiving, demodulating, and then mapping the symbols back to bits. And so that's all easy enough if you have no problems in your system. So of course, we're gonna introduce problems. Problem number one is noise. You're gonna see what effect noise has on the error of your system. Second is phase. Um, third is if you band limit your uh, signals, you're gonna get inter-symbol interference. So you can actually visualize that in the time domain, which is kind of fun. And of course, in order to mitigate that, we apply the raised cosine windowing or root raised cosine window windowing rather. And of course, during this process, you're gonna to have to plot a lot of things, uh, namely constellation diagrams will be a big one. So that, that'll give you some practice with that. All right, so that's it for this lecture, I guess. Any other questions? All right, so we'll call it quits there.